All right, y'all, you're locked on Falcons. I'm your host, Aaron Freeman. Today, we're talking about day one of the joint practices between the Falcons and Jacksonville Jaguars, as well as the triumphant or perhaps not so triumphant return of Deion Jones to practice. You are locked on Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So guys, you know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, been covering the Falcons for many years over at falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong on Twitter, at falcfans, you know me, aka Sirius Black, aka your very humble host of this daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And guys, today's episode of Locked on Falcons is brought to you by Brightco Jewelry and Watch Insurance. Brightco brings you comprehensive, fast, and affordable jewelry insurance for low, as low as $5 per month. Check out your special offer for Locked on listeners and get covered in under two minutes at brightco, bright.co forward slash locked on. That's bright.co forward slash locked up. So guys, we thank you for making Locked on Falcons your first listen. Each and every day, of course, Locked On Falcons is free and available on a variety of podcast platforms Monday through Friday, including Apple, Odyssey, Google, and Spotify. And of course, you can also check out Locked On Falcons on YouTube. And if you subscribe, you hit that bell, you give us a like, you'll get the video version of the podcast the night before the audio drops. So today's episode... We will have some listener questions to answer at the end of the episode, but we'll spend the early part of today's episode talking about the return of Deion Jones. Finally, Deion Jones is back, baby. Um, and, you know, for those of you that have not been following along all summer long, there's been a long timeline when it has come to Deion Jones. Right. You go back to the episodes we were talking about in May. Right. And it was basically the conclusion I had reached then. Oh, he's going to get cut. He's going to get traded at some point before training camp starts. But there's little to no chance of him being on the roster once training camp kicks off in late July. That wound up not being true because shortly thereafter, in the early part of June, we learned that he had had cleanup surgery on his shoulder and was out for the rest of the offseason. That was going to complicate the ability of the Falcons to move on from him uh, until he was fully healthy. Uh, and then he led that led to him starting out um, training camp when things kicked off. The Falcons officially put him on the physically unable to perform list, the pup list, uh, on July 21st. And then we got word from Jeff Schultz, our good buddy over at The Athletic, on August 1st, uh, that basically saying the Falcons, despite trying to trade Deion Jones, hadn't found any takers and have no intention of cutting him, and he'll be back at training camp at some point. So now today, Deion Jones is finally healthy. He's off the pup list. So he's ready to come back and compete, um, and we'll see what comes of that. Now, going back over that timeline, this entire time, I never really thought a trade would develop for Deion Jones. I still don't think a trade will develop for Deion Jones, largely due to the fact that the Falcons have been quietly and not so quietly shopping him for the better part of a year, in 18 months, going back to February and probably March of 2021. And since a trade hasn't happened in those 18 months, it's very unlikely that a trade will happen in the next 18 days or so. Um, and you never know how these things happen because a lot of these trades are facilitated by injuries and whatnot. So if another team loses his starting linebacker in the next few days between now and when final cuts are made next Tuesday on August 30th, then that certainly could force a team's hand to be a lot more willing to trade assets uh, for Deion Jones. But because I did not have this expectation that, you know, the Falcons would be able to su successfully pull off a trade of Deion Jones, I've gone throughout this entire process that when push came to shove at some point, and I, again, I thought that was going to be in June uh, earlier this year, but, you know, now, you know, going back to the early August, I thought that would be August 30th when final cuts that the Falcons would wind up cutting Deion Jones. And if they don't do that, they don't find a trade partner, they don't cut him, then the Falcons will be compelled to keep Deion Jones on the roster and he'll count roughly $20 million against their salary cap this year. 
Uh, and, you know, from my perspective, that doesn't make a ton of sense, given that this team kind of has moved on from Deion Jones. Um, and that certainly comes from good authority uh, from people that also that cover this team. But also, you know, I wouldn't need inside information to kind of read between the lines and looking at all the investments that the Falcons have made at the linebacker position with signing guys like Rashawn Evans and then Nick Witkowski and drafting Troy Anderson, that the team is ready to move forward uh, at the linebacker position and already have added all the pieces that necessary for them uh, to, you know, move on from Deion Jones. And I think, you know, this was something I said back in mid-May was that I don't think you're signing Nick Kwiatkowski to come in and play special teams. Like you could have a Dorian Etheridge play that role. You could have an undrafted free agent like a Nate Landman come in and, and play special teams. You're signing Nick Kwiatkowski uh, because you are expecting him to come in and compete for a starting spot. Now, he has been dealing with injuries uh, as of late, and that's led to the emergence of Michael Walker, who seems to have a firm grip on that. Uh, it should be noted that Nick Kwiatkowski was also back at practice on Wednesday in those joint practices against the Jaguars alongside Deion Jones, playing next to Deion Jones with the third string defense. But when you look at these two players in comparison, uh, you know, both coming off injuries, both presumably stuck in terms of death rules. Nick Kwiatkowski is only got a cap hit of $1 million. Deion Jones has a cap hit of $20 million. And if you're going to justify one of these guys being a backup and playing special teams, Kwiatkowski has the experience doing both. And Deion Jones doesn't really have that experience. So it seems to make more sense if one of these guys is going to come off the bench and contribute to your team, it's going to be Nick Kwiatkowski. But um, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I will sit here and say that despite, you know, being firm in my opinion for three months that Deion Jones has played his last snap as an Atlanta Falcon, at least in a, in a regular season game, um, you know, I think it's time maybe, you know, just maybe I might get something wrong here on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I do think it's 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 worth revisiting and, and worth potentially revising, right? Because you got the today and, and tomorrow of practice, you know, that's probably not going to be enough practice for Deion Jones to play on Saturday against the Jaguar. So we won't see him in the preseason at any point. Um, and you know, then you have the final cuts on Tuesday. And so if the Falcons are potentially looking to move on from him, which all signs seem to indicate, if you're in Terry Fontenot's shoes, it's going to be hard to do that uh, between now and Tuesday because essentially you're hoping that some team suffers a, a major injury at the linebacker position over the next couple of days that forces their hand to make a trade for Deion Jones between now and Tuesday. Um, but as I said, you know, since something hasn't developed in the last 18 months, it's not particularly likely that something will develop. But we'll, we'll sort of see. Um you know, if, if something can develop in the next five days, um, but, you know, it does seem like Deion Jones is probably going to be a couple of weeks away from getting back into true playing shape so that he can contribute uh, to a football team. Um, so, you know, you sit here and you go like if the Falcons are so averse to cutting Deion Jones, you know, it's understandable. Someone on Twitter pointed this out to me a couple of weeks ago, uh, basically saying that, you know, a reason why the team might not cut him is because you would imagine one of the first teams that would probably give Deion Jones a call if he was free and available is a team that the Falcons are facing uh, week one. Uh, and that team also is currently dealing with an injured weak side linebacker uh, that's, you know, been missing a couple of days of practice. So they may be looking at shoring up that position with a player uh, that they are very familiar with. Um, and so, you know, if that means that the Falcons are not going to cut him to avoid that fate or uh, for other reasons, um, you know, maybe that does mean that the Falcons will decide to wind up carrying him uh, even at his high cap fit uh, into the season and hope that something develops between the start of the regular season and the trade deadline, which will be in either late October, or early November, around week eight of the season. So that gives them another two months to figure out what to do with uh, Deion Jones. But, um, you know, for three months, I've refused to have Deion Jones on my 53 man roster projection. Uh, and you now I stand before you as this very humbled podcast host being like, now I might have to revisit that. If I was doing a roster prediction today, you know, I don't know if I would still put Deion Jones on it, but I would certainly think about it a lot harder than I have over the last three months. So we'll see if over the next five days, I go completely 180 and say, you know what, Deion Jones is going to be on the team this year. And we'll find out on Tuesday if he's going to be on the team, I, I think, uh, in, in terms of that, how that goes. But, um, you know, I'll still maintain to take credit on predicting that Deion Jones gets cut because even if they do keep him this year, that probably means they'll wind up cutting him next March. And I'll be like, I told you guys, 
that they were going to cut him. And you'd probably be like, well, Aaron, you said it was going to happen nine months before. And I would say that's that doesn't matter. Right. The prophecy was foretold that they would cut him. I never said when they would cut him. I would say that they would actually cut him. So I actually technically got it right. Thank you. I, I wasn't wrong. Never again. It's never happened before in my life. So we'll, we'll see what comes with the Deion Jones situation. We have a little bit more to say on Deion Jones when we get back to the Q&A portion later in today's episode. But coming up, we'll talk about day one of joint practices with the Jaguars, what we learned, particularly when it comes to to the Falcons cornerback death. But before we get there, guys, I do want to plug the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, where you can find three shows with four hosts, breaking down not only local sports, but national sports. That's A to Z with Mark Zeno, Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, and ATL Day Ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste. And Locked On Sports Atlanta is also the place for the Locked On Braves postcast, where Locked On Braves is breaking down every Braves win and loss this year. And it's also the place for the Locked On Falcons postcast, where myself and Jarvis Davis will be breaking down every Falcons win, loss, and tie this year, including on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening after the, the preseason finale against the Jaguars and continuing into the regular season against the Saints and the Rams and other teams um, as the season unfolds. So Locked on Sports Atlanta on your preferred podcast platform is the place to be for all the content that you want to get on these local sports teams. The postcasts are on the YouTube, but you can check out all those shows on the audio platforms, the same ones that you listen to Locked on Falcons. And guys, I want to talk about how the internet is kind of a place for epic fails, right? You know, whether we're talking about gender reveals gone wrong or public proposals that just don't go your way, uh, you can go viral in an instant for, you know, what can be a bad circumstance. And whether, you know, that proposal didn't go your way because that certain someone said no in front of 20,000 people, or you tried to be romantic by going out on the boat or going out there on the pier uh, where you first had your first date. And in the process of getting down on one knee, you know, the ring slips out, the boat uh, flips and you wind up, you know, that ring that you spent months saving up for winds up in the water. Uh, and you definitely don't want to be that guy. You don't want to see your failure splattered all over the internet and going viral for all the wrong reasons. Now, while there is no insurance, for that special someone saying no, there is protection to keep that ring from winding up in the wrong place. And the guys at Brightco Jewelry Insurance will make sure you get the replacement at the full value of your ring, no matter if it's lost, stolen, or you just can't figure out what happened to it. So go to bright.co forward slash locked on. It's the fastest, easiest, and cheapest way to cover your butt when with the best jewelry insurance in the business. So let's talk about the first day of joint practices between the Falcons and Jaguars. Of course, they'll continue on day two on Thursday, as most of you are listening to this, and we'll see what happens. No sort of big sweeping takeaways of anything crazy happening. No fights, no one team, one side dominating the other. It sounded like it was a healthy back and forth, uh, you know, in terms of who won uh, the practice. It doesn't sound like any team particularly came out ahead. Um, it sounded like both sides had kind of their ups and downs. It seemed like the first team Falcons offense did a, a pretty good job. It seems like the first team Jaguars offense did a pretty good job uh, from the reports. Marcus Mario was very sharp in seven on seven drills. I think it was eight for nine uh, in those situations. Apparently Kyle Pitts had a big sort of highlight reel catch uh, in being double covered in 11 on 11. Unfortunately, it wasn't video because that's the portion of practice that doesn't get uh isn't allowed to be taped um marvin jones had a, a nice one-handed catch that was on video against dean marlowe uh but i think later in the practice dean marlowe broke up a pass to him i think mike ford was credited with two pass breakups as well uh christian kirk got the better of d alford on a pair of scores in some of those one-on-one -on -one drills um as well as alford breaking up a couple of throws uh it was reported by jaguars uh beat writers that arden key stood out and that's kind of notable because I, I as i understand it again i'm not an expert on this but um you know arden key i think tends to line up against the left guard uh of of the falcons offensive line so we'll see how that plays out in the game on saturday but uh you know other reports indicate that the Falcons' second team unit was offense was looking pretty sharp. 
Uh, and we'll chalk that up to Desmond Ritter's greatness. So it sounded like a pretty even back and forth day. You know, I don't think anybody's going to be penciling the Jaguars or the Falcons going to the Super Bowl based off of this uh, practice, similar to what we saw last weekend uh, with the Jets Falcons joint practices. Although I will, I will sit here and cut the Jets beat writers some slack. They probably were a little bit too overzealous uh, talking up the, the Jets performances in that. But to be fair to them, the Jets have been a bad team for the last decade. So it's probably rare for them to see too many interviews. This is where the Jets, quote unquote, dominate, um, as some people put it, clearly are the better team, whether it's on the practice field or in an actual game. Uh, so they probably got a little bit too excited, too overzealous in that regard. But uh, talking about today's joint practice, another thing that stood out was that Avery Williams got some work at cornerback. Uh, and Arthur Smith said that was for emergency situations. Now we've seen Williams make the transition from a cornerback last year. Uh, when he was drafted to the offensive side of the ball and it was mentioned as running back but at least in the preseason games the bulk of his reps have come more as a wide receiver right essentially his usage is kind of very similar to how the falcons utilize cordero patterson at least on passing downs where it was roughly uh half and half you know at wide receiver half and half in the backfield but slightly more um in terms of snaps at wide receiver in either in the slot or split out wide for Patterson. And the same thing has occurred for Williams so far in the preseason. So um not sure what that means for Williams in the cornerback conversation, as far as that, what that means in terms of Williams's usage at the wide receiver position, that's been part of the reason why, you know, consistently I've thought all along that they've, they would only keep five, wide receivers because on the roster on the 53 man roster in large part due to the fact that you can count Patterson and, and Williams now seemingly as kind of a half a receiver. So that's keeping six so that they don't necessarily have to keep extra guys, um, you know, on the roster in that regard. And that's part of the reason why I was not particularly high on, on Tate, who was wound up being cut uh, on Tuesday and, and why, despite how good he's been in, in the preseason and throughout training camp, I'm not necessarily going to slot Jared Bernhardt on the roster, but maybe he goes off on Saturday against the Jaguars and, and suddenly the Falcons are like, look, we got to keep him uh, at least through the first week of, of the season uh, so that someone doesn't scoop him up off of waivers. But circling back to the cornerback situation, um, you know, I'm not sure this matters all that much into how Williams figures into it, unless we see more days of Williams going back to cornerback. Um, you know, what was also not notable at the cornerback position on today's practice was that Darren Hall sort of relieved A.J. Terrell on first team reps. Uh, and, you know, all of a sudden that means that A.J. Terrell's on the roster. But no, of course, I'm kidding. Uh, no, you know, I, I think that's a positive sign. Um, for Darren Hall and particularly for me personally, because one of the, my major question marks going into training camp was, do the Falcons have adequate depth at that cornerback position? We know the starters in AJ Terrell and Casey Hayward and uh, Isaiah Oliver, at least we believe, maybe we don't know, but we believe that the starters are one of the better trio of corners in the NFL uh, this year, but you have major concerns about depth, right? There are Injuries happen all the time. We saw A.J. Terrell go out of games with concussions. We saw Fabian Moreau go out of games last year, and that led to Chris Williamson and T.J. Green, and all of a sudden a strength becomes a weakness if you don't have adequate depth there. And the fact that Darren Hall's getting those first-team reps suggests that he's earned those reps uh, is a good sign that um, Hall you know, has been working pretty much exclusively uh, as an outside corner uh, so far in camp. Uh, and my assumption has been that's because we saw what he did primarily as a slot corner last year. So he doesn't necessarily have to prove himself in that regard. Uh, but he seems to have emerged as that primary backup outside corner. We've seen uh, D. Alford work both inside and outside. Mike Ford has been almost exclusively as a slot corner um, going there. So, um, you know, I think that's a good sign that Hall's getting that outside work and, and getting that trust of the coaching staff to, to work with the ones, at least if if only for a couple of reps on one day of practice, uh, we'll take what we can get there as far as that goes, especially because I had major question marks about whether or not Hall could thrive as an outside corner in the NFL, at least based off of his film in college a year ago. So it's a good sign that maybe he's 
going to overcome those concerns that I had, and, and that won't be an issue for him moving forward. So uh, we'll see what develops there here with the backup cornerback position. You're looking at these three guys, Hall, Alford, and, and Mike Ford, as at this point in time, virtual locks uh, to make the roster. Hopefully they will be able to stay healthy for a couple more days and make it uh, there. Um but, you know, I think given the likelihood of the Falcons only having five active corners on game day, one of these three guys is going to be inactive on game day. And I don't think at this point in time it's going to be Darren Hall. I don't think it's going to be Mike Ford, which leaves it to be basically D. Alford, which is why in the last couple of days over the last week, you've heard a lot of growing buzz. At least I've heard a lot of growing buzz from fans. That, oh, D. Alford could potentially push and overtake. Isaiah Oliver for the starting nickel role, or the the Falcons could you know put him in, in a dime package uh, in some form or faction when they put four corners on the field and move uh, Oliver to safety as he's gotten some work there. And I just think right now that's probably premature because right now I think the offer would probably be inactive on game day. So uh, you're more likely to see someone like Darren Hall or or Mike Ford in that sort of fourth cornerback role uh, in that regard. But uh, we'll we'll see what what develops over the next couple of days and as we get set for the regular season and we'll see what develops the rest of the way on today's episode as we get into the Q&A portion of today's episode and we'll talk about what exactly Deion Jones is competing for as well as whether or not changing sides moving to the right side of the Falcons offensive line would actually help Jalen Mayfield become a better player but uh before we get there guys um you know the falcons are in the process of finding all the right people to help their team win this fall and perhaps you are in the process of finding the right people to help your team that is your small business uh fire on all cylinders this fall and linkedin jobs is here to make it easier for you to find the right people that you want to talk to faster and for free you can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach the world's largest professional network of over 800 million people. LinkedIn Jobs helps you spread the word that you're hiring and gives you simple tools like screen questions to make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right candidates that you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So uh, let's talk. Let's answer some listener questions. And the first question was not submitted by a listener. Um, we'll say it was Joe Falcon fan 87. And he asked, can Debo compete for a starting spot in week one? Um, and the answer to this uh, fake question is no, I don't think he can. Now, what one thing that Arthur Smith did do praising uh, Deion Jones after practice was his willingness to compete. Um, but, you know, I, good for him. Um, but, you know, I sit here and I go, what is he competing for? Because I don't think he's competing for a starting spot. I, I think maybe he could certainly be competing for a backup spot um, alongside Nick Kwiatkowski with Dorian Ethwich and, and Nate Landman and those guys. Um, but, you know, in terms of finding a starting spot in the next 10 or so days, uh, given give or take a, a couple of days, I think that's how many practices the Falcons have between now and week one when they're playing the Saints on on, on September 11th. Um, you know, I don't think you can win a starting job in 10 days. Now, you may sit there and say, well, you know, Elijah Wilkinson won the starting job at left guard and like two days at the beginning of the training camp, but you got to remember that's a cumulative, right? That's factoring not only those first couple of days of training camp, but also, you know, OTAs in June and in May and, and mini camps and all those various things. So rather than just sort of 10 days of practice going into that conversation, that's really more like 10 weeks uh, of evaluations going into that decision to elevate Elijah Wilkinson. So, um, you know, I, I don't see Deion Jones competing for anything more than a backup spot this year. Now, maybe if Michael Walker comes out here and plays terribly the first couple of weeks, the Falcons might, you know, make a switch there. But other than that, I think Deion Jones, if he is on the team, uh, will just be relegated to being a backup. Now, let's imagine for a second that that is the case, that Deion Jones does make the roster and is relegated to a backup. And I sit here and I wonder, is he going to be active on game days if he is a backup? And I think there's a real question on whether or not he is because he doesn't really play special teams. Right. The last time Deion Jones played special teams really was the first month of his rookie season 
So it's been almost six years, uh, September of 2016. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think you're going to expect him to do that now suddenly uh, in year seven of his NFL career. Um, now he can certainly come off the bench and, and be kind of a nickel specialist. That's what Michael Walker did last year. Um, but Michael Walker, most most weeks outside of a handful of games where he had to start uh, in, in place of an injured Deion Jones or got some garbage time reps late in the game in some blowouts, uh, most weeks he was averaging like less than seven snaps a game. So, you know, are you going to pay Deion Jones $20 million to basically play five snaps off the bench in this sort of nickel, you know, three, three, five, uh, you know, third linebacker role like Michael Walker did last year. Uh, I don't know that that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, you know, this is part of the reason why I've been so adamant, if you want to call it that, that I think they'll probably wind up cutting him because, you know, you're going to pay a guy $20 million to play five snaps for you. Uh, you know, so, and then you're like, okay, you want to hold on to him because you want to get something for him rather than getting nothing for him. But what are you going to get for him? Right. If you could get something good, you know, given that we know the Falcons want to move on, they would have made that trade by now. So like, what are you going to get? Like a six round pick, a seventh round pick, maybe uh, if you do trade him at the trade deadline later this year, um, is that really worth it? You know, to, to get a extra late round pick? I don't think it is. So, um, you know, it's, it's tough because like, I know a lot of people will see this as, you know, anti Debo or hating on Debo. And they're like, that's not what I'm, I'm trying to do. I like, you know, if it's coming across that way, I, I apologize, but I, I don't have any problem with Deion Jones, right? I have no problem with him being on this team. Uh, all things being equal. My point is $20 million makes things very unequal. Um, you know, I'm not one of these people that's waking up every single day wanting to blame Deion Jones and, and act like, you know, the Falcons upgrading Deion Jones. If, if you believe that's the case, which, you know, I, I, I think remains to be seen if the Falcons have gotten better linebacker play. We, we hope we believe we, we want to believe that they're going to get better linebacker play than they got out of Deion Jones these last couple of years, but that remains to be seen. Um, but like, I'm not one of these people that feels like, oh, it's like addition by subtraction and moving on from Deion Jones is going to make this defense so much better. Like, no, it's not. Like, I've been saying for five years, like, <laughs> this team, defense will go as far as the pass rush will carry it. Like, if they have a bottom five pass rush, they're going to have a bottom five defense, guys. You know, like, who cares about the linebackers? I, I mean, not to sit here and say they're inconsequential or whatever, but, like, let's not over-exaggerate the importance of, of, of the linebacker position and, and how critical it is to unlocking the full potential of the Falcons' defense. If you can't get pressure on the quarterback, who cares what your linebackers are doing at this point in time? Um, so that's kind of why I'm at a point where I'm just like, you know, if, if you don't want them on the team, and again, I'm not saying I don't want them on the team. I'm just saying to me, there's clear indications that they don't want them on the team, then just cut them. Right. You know, if we've, we've moved on mentally, emotionally, right. We just haven't done so financially when it comes to Deion Jones. And, you know, you can sit there and say, well, there, there's no value to it because you're not freeing up cap space. Yeah. But like, it's not about cap space at this point in time, right? You're already carrying $63 million in dead money, which is an NFL record. If I uh, correct in that regard. So what's the point in, you know, what's the fear in adding $19 million more? You're already setting the record. Might as well go for broke, right? You know, like set a record that's going to stand for all of time, get it to 83 million or whatever it is. Uh, and, and you're a rebuilding football team. So you shouldn't be ashamed of carrying a massive amount of dead money. That's the signal to the entire world that that's what you're doing. You're rebuilding, right? You're, you're getting out of this cap situation that Thomas Dimitrov, you know, handcuffed this roster and handcuffed this organization with. Uh, so to me, just cut them. That's, that's kind of my, my stance on it. But, um, you know, apparently the, the Falcon saints rivalry is just too strong and the Falcons will say, we'll, we'll eat $20 million just to keep him out of new Orleans. At least, you know, I, I, at least a, a one person on Twitter thinks that's the case. So maybe they're right. Uh, so, uh, that's the only thing to me that makes sense. If the Falcons don't cut them, that they're basically like, well, you just don't want him to go to New Orleans, and we will, out of spite, <laughs> we will we will keep him on the roster, uh, you know, even if we don't necessarily want him. We definitely don't want those guys to have him. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. Now, our real question came from Nacho F at Nacho ATL on Twitter. He asked, do you think Mayfield could be better off moving to right guard to back up Lindstrom? I wonder if he could at least improve something there since he played on the right side in college. Now, it might help. Right. But I don't think Jalen Mayfield's issues are related to which side of the field he plays on. Right. You can compare him to someone like Wes Schweitzer, 
um, who spent the entirety of his uh, career at San, D San Jose State uh, playing almost exclusively at left tackle and then obviously was being groomed to replace Chris Chester at right guard starting in that 2017 season. But then you kind of saw, you know, a, a kind of a lackluster year one as a starter. But then you saw in subsequent years where he got into the mix at left guard due to some injuries to Andy Levitri, um, he actually was kind of better at left guard or at least tended to be a little bit better at left guard than he was at right guard, which may have been owed to the fact that he was more comfortable playing on the left side. And for those of you that aren't aware of it, the reason why which side of the offensive line matters, at least somewhat, is because your footwork is different if you play on the left side versus the right side. And so when you have that like muscle memory from playing years and years on one side, you've built up that muscle memory to playing on one side. And then all of a sudden, even if you know it seems simple that you can just flip it, like you don't have the same muscle memory. And so it takes time to develop that. Right. Which is part of the reason why, you know, offensive linemen, um, you know, take time to develop, you know, multiple years in that. Now, certain players can do it. Zach Martin's a great example of a player that was exclusively the left tackle at Notre Dame, then came in right away as a right guard for Dallas and was lights out from the jump. But, you know, Zach Martin's going to be a Hall of Famer. Right. That's you can book that. Take that to the bank. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. So probably not the best comparison, you know, but the point is some guys can do it. But the point is, it's it's not automatic that everybody can do it. Um, and you know, with Wes Schweitzer, you know, you could make the case that playing, moving him to one side or the other could help unlock his full potential because Schweitzer's issues in the NFL were not necessarily physically physical deficiencies, right? Uh, you know, when you look at his 10 yard split, his 40 yard time, his broad jumps, his vertical jump, his short shuttle, his three cone, you know, the athletic testing drills at the combine that are most pertinent to most positions in the league, but certainly for the offensive linemen, you know, those athletic and those explosive metrics that you're looking for. If you average Schweitzer's percentiles across those six drills, he f was a 67th percentile athlete for a guard. Right now, when you do the same thing for Jalen Mayfield, he's only a 38th percentile athlete. And so I think for that reason, regardless of which side you're going to put Jalen Mayfield on, even if he's more comfortable on the right side, he's still going to be an underwhelming athlete. And that's going to get regularly explode, exposed. Right. So even if he does have better footwork on the right side, he's still not going to be athletic enough to really take advantage of, you know, it slightly improved footwork. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, the issue with Jalen Mayfield. And, you know, I could sit here and spend another 10 minutes ranting about all the, the issues with Jalen Mayfield, but basically it summarizes uh, the summary of it is, uh, you know, he was a bad bet to begin with the Falcons made the mistake of doubling down on that bet this off season. And now we're in the situation where we're trying to figure out ways of, Hey, maybe we, if we do this, it may, you know, the bet is it's a sunk cost, right? That's, that's basically um, what it appears to be at this point in time. Now, maybe Jalen Mayfield, you know, is able to continue developing and becomes a halfway decent player down the road. But as I said, back in May of last year, um, it was a situation that was very unlikely to work out on the timeline that the Falcons have. Now, hopefully Elijah Wilkinson can solidify uh, the spot. You know, I'm, I'm expecting James Carpenter level of play from Elijah Wilkinson, which is not good, but is better than what we got out of Jalen Mayfield. Uh, it, it's funny to me because, like, if you go back to when Wes Schweitzer was playing on his team, he was not a very popular person among Falcon fans and, and media types in terms of his performance. People always thought he was upgraded. But if I asked people today, like, would you rather have Wes Schweitzer starting uh, for this team? You, I, I think with 100 percent approval rating, people would be like, oh, Wes Schweitzer was great. Right. That's how that's how low we've sunk. So uh, we'll see if, uh, you know, Elijah Wilkinson can raise the floor. We'll see if Jalen Mayfield, you know, his future can turn himself around. But, you know, I, I think six months from now, we'll be talking about going out there and and replacing both of these guys uh, at the left guard position and, and stopping the bleeding, so to speak, at that spot. So um, if you want to hear more about my thoughts on Jalen Mayfield, um, you can just basically Google Locked on Falcons to Jalen Mayfield and there's plenty of content from last summer and last season uh, talking about that. But uh, yeah, um, we'll just see how that goes. But uh, I don't think Nacho that it's going to really make much of a difference at this point in time. It's it's kind of a sunk cost, as I said. But uh, that's it, guys. I appreciate you for uh, submitting your questions, Nacho. He's 
did so on Twitter at Locked On Falcons. You can do so on Facebook at Locked On Falcons. You can send an email to Locked On Falcons at mail.com. And of course, you can leave a comment here on the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel. And guys, we'll be back tomorrow to talk more about joint practices between the Falcons and Jaguars, see what else develops, see if uh, Troy Anderson picks a fight with, um, you know, Trevor Lawrence, I guess, Travis Etienne. I, I don't know who you pick a fight with. Uh, you know, you know, hopefully Jarvis will get his wish on that front. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go listen to what Friday's episode was it where Jarvis was talking about that. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> Sorry, got distracted. So go check that out. Go check out Locked On Sports Atlanta as your second listen. Uh, check out Locked On Braves, Locked On Bulldogs, Locked On Hawks as well. Uh, also, you can check out Locked On uh, Fantasy Football because it's Fantasy Draft Week. Um, and uh, you can get host uh, Vinny Iyer's thoughts on the sort of positional top 10 uh, all week long. And, of course, next week, uh, the ultimate Pro Football Preview here on Locked On kicks off, uh, where you'll have local experts like myself uh, giving you that all incumbency preview uh, beginning on August 31st. Eight episodes features the local experts like myself, Odyssey NFL Insiders. Again, starting August 31st, all you got to do is search Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Guys, I appreciate it. Till then.